Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to everyone uh, from Central Time West. And I hope you've been enjoying our virtual expo so far. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that we've given you some helpful information to guide your work as we move through the reopening phases of the pandemic. Um, just as Scott has said, uh, we've been calling it the restart, but we all know that you have been doing lots of work uh, in the meantime. Uh, before we begin, though, I want to take a moment to thank our partners at REI, uh, who is sponsoring this session. We are grateful for their support, and we want to make sure to share a quick note about their company. Um, REI is honored to be a longstanding part of the CTA family. Um, they're especially proud to be sponsoring the Communicating Transit Safety and Preparedness to the Community session. Um, CT, CTAA member transits have relied on REI surveillance and video monitors since 1973. Um, REI camera systems are currently available to you as part of your state bus contracts and Section 5311 purchases. REI also engineers high definition video monitor platforms for passenger safety and information, which we will discuss today. Um, <clears throat> now, more than ever, REI's video information monitors are communicating COVID-19 safety messages and passenger safety information in buses throughout North America. Monitors are invaluable tools for delivering messages with clarity and brilliance. <clears throat> During your important decision-making processes for bus safety improvements, please keep REI in mind and inquire about their special digital media kits for CTA members. The kit includes a high definition video monitor and easy to use digital media player. Engineered for reliability and easily integrated with existing PA systems, it can provide immediate and important information to your passengers. The kit installs easily anywhere on your bus and will help keep your passengers and drivers safe long after the crisis has passed. REI is working hard to keep everyone safe during this crisis and looks forward to continuing strong partnerships with the transit community. And so please reach out to Patrick O'Donnell, who's the territory manager with REI, uh, directly for information about REI's innovative digital media kit and additional CARES Act safety products by calling his cell phone at 402-618-3823 or emailing him at p.odonnell at radioeng. Dot com. Um, so it's P-O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L -L at radioeng.com. Aria, I thank you for your time. Um, and let's get started with the session. So as a quick reminder, before I move forward, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can submit questions. My colleague, Alex King, is going to be monitoring the Q&A throughout this session. Um, Alex will jump in with any questions if they piggyback right off of what um, the panelists and I are talking about, or, or we will make sure that we um, answer uh, as many as possible at the end of this panel. And um, any question that we do not answer live, we will go through at the end of this and we will email out answers. So if we don't get to your question today, we will make sure to answer your question um, after this wraps up. And so each topic we have talked about throughout the past two days is integral to continuing to serve your riders during the crisis and to helping your communities emerge from this pandemic. Um, but where all of this behind the scenes work comes into effect is how you communicate that safety with the public, um, especially in the face of a number of influential bodies such as the CDC or even the New York Stock Exchange recommending against or even prohibiting transit use. We know that our transit systems are safe, but a lot of um, other organizations uh, have failed to realize that. And so we um, need to make sure that we get that message properly out to the rest of the community. Uh, as our executive director, Scott Bogren, recently stated, the only way to deal with a perception of risk is to deal with it squarely and openly. So sadly, uh, perception is reality for a lot of people, regardless of facts underneath it. And so uh, how are you communicating uh, the safety measures that you are implementing uh, for your vehicles, for your facilities, for your drivers and your passengers? What innovative services have you uh, as transit operators offered during the pandemic 
to continue serving your community and even when they aren't available able to take the bus such as local partnerships to deliver food or other services to uh, homebound residents. <clears throat> We've seen many stories of how transit agencies have become an essential link in not only transporting people to resources, but resources to people. Uh, how have you communicated that with your communities, both to make sure people can take advantage uh, of those services, but also to further the message of transit as the backbone of the community? And also, how can we connect to the public through both communications and innovative partnerships? Um, and that all lies at the crux of what the new public transit service model will be as the public health emergency eases and will be influential in determining how central of a role transit plays in rebuilding our economies as commerce is able to grow again on the other end of the pandemic. Um, and with all of that in mind, um, Alex Taylor and Amy Conrick and I reached out to our panelists that we have on today. Uh, we have Gail Nels of Invita in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And um, Alex, Amy, and I have worked closely with Gail, but we have had conversations about working to spread the message that their service is space, their, their service is safe. Uh, we also have uh, Pamela Bino Reed of Comet in Columbia, South Carolina, who have been delivering uh, meals to older adults in the community. And then we also have Nicholas Oldham from uh, WeGo Transit in Nashville, Tennessee, where they actually brought in a public health expert to evaluate their practices and share their effectiveness with the public. Uh, so Gail, Nick, uh, Gail, Nicholas, and Pamela will join me for the next 60 minutes in a discussion on how their systems have addressed the topics of communication and partnerships. From their success stories to lessons learned, we hope that you will engage the conversation by submitting your questions in the Q&A box. And so this is not going to be presentation style. There won't be any slides. Uh, this is going to be a conversation among all of us. And uh, so I want to kick this off with Gail. Um, I know your agency has focused primarily on how to communicate a positive message, uh, focused on your efforts to keep passengers safe. Can you talk a bit about that? Sure. Thank you for having me as part of your panel. Of course, we're flattered to be part of this group um, because it is our mission and it's not always recognized for what we do in our communities. Um, when we encountered the COVID, I called it the, uh, uh, I guess it was March 17th here in Colorado where everything came to a standstill. Uh, we were reeling about what does that mean and, and how do we move forward? And it really was, frankly, some of the um, CARES Act that allowed us to be courageous about how we move forward. Um, I think many of us know in transportation, uh, drivers are a key uh, success factor in what we do. And we did not want to furlough them. We did not want to lay anyone off. So we basically kept our buses running as much as we could. And that we were, because the uh, Paycheck Protection Program also allowed us to pay them, they were like, um, I thought, reassuring in the community. And we even kept our rural route in um, Eastern El Paso County, which is basically a Plains rural um, community out and running because people wanted to know we were there and we even got thank you um, notes on our Facebook page regarding that. So that was one thing we did. We also stepped up for a, um, for safety. Uh, there was a consortium of nonprofits, um, the county health department, and we have the School of Medicine, works with community health down here in Colorado Springs. Uh, that was looking for transportation partners for a homeless um, isolation center. And um, no one else was stepping up. So it was like a Friday afternoon call, um, evening 7.30, we, we said we would help uh, transport people that were um, suspected of being COVID positive and even those that were COVID positive. And so what that meant from a safety perspective is, you know, all those missives and emails that came out from FTA, DOT, our own Colorado public health and environment uh, agencies and um, operational memos and executive orders from the governor. Uh, we tried to read them all as fast as we could and implement their recommendations to keep everyone safe. But actually from the isolation center and having um, several MDs um, on that consortium, 
we felt that we were in full compliance and making sure that our drivers were safe and that our riders were safe if they were getting on the bus. So that's some of what we just initially started with on um, looking at how to you know, serve our community. Excellent, thanks. And especially in the, uh, the smaller areas where you guys serve, I feel like that's especially important just to show that you're there and still, still serving. Um, and so that makes me think of uh, Nick with WeGo in Nashville. Uh, you and your agency had reached out to a local public health expert to kind of evaluate and um, show the safety in your uh, procedures after COVID-19 spread. And so can you go a little bit more into uh, that effort and how you use that to communicate with uh, the area? Are you hearing me okay, Andrew? Yes, you're you're a little bit distant, but I can hear you. Distant. Let's see if we can get a little closer. How about that? Great. Okay, perfect. Um, so, what's interesting about our our story is that when we did reach out to uh, public health, um, the th I think two days before our first case of uh, COVID nineteen in, in Tennessee, um, we had a tornado. And uh, so we were all in the command center um, and I just happened to look over and see the uh, director of uh, public health. And uh, so I reached out to him and asked if he would come by our um, facility uh, to see um, what we were doing, look at our, our practices, our, our disinfecting practices and kind of offer recommendations. So uh, we, we pulled a bus out uh, to the front of our lot. We had our cleaning crew uh, come out and, and demonstrate to uh, the director of public health and a few members of his staff um, what we were doing and ask for their recommendations. Um, as a result, um, they, you know, kind of recommended that we, um, you know, hike up our, our efforts. Uh, one of the things that was pointed out was, you know, we didn't, we hadn't thought about the pool cord where passengers pulled to uh, signify they want to get off the bus. Um, there, you know, as a result of them viewing our practice, uh, they said, yeah, you might want to, you know, put that, uh, that pool cord in your cleaning um, regimen. So that was really, really helpful. And uh, also we, we, um, we reached out to them. They provided us with materials to educate um, our employees on, you know, all things COVID-19 related, how it spreads, uh, the risk of exposure. And uh, they also provided us with uh, training material on good hand washing practices and other routine infection uh, control uh, precautions. And we used our digital content management system uh, to display um, all of that material. Um, they also uh, recommended that we, you know, heighten our, our disinfecting practices for buses between trips. So when buses would pull into our bay um, at our central hub, uh, we, we closed down public, our public restrooms and the public waiting areas to free up more staff so that they could, uh, we could use that staff, that cleaning crew, um, to get on buses. So when buses would pull into the bays, uh, when the operators would get off to, um, you know, go inside and, and grab a drink or uh, go to the restroom, then, you know, our cleaning crew would jump on that bus and clean all the high touch uh, surface areas stanchion bars, the driver's compartment, um, all of the handrails, the pool cord, um, and uh, some of the ADA um, uh, environment. So uh, that was another thing that we got as a result of, of dealing with, the, um, with, with, a health, with our health department here. Uh, we also installed um, sanitation stations at our central hub so that, um, and they were just really quickly put together out of wood uh, but it you know, had dispensers on them so that the public, as they were moving between buses, um, could also just you know, have hand sanitizer. Uh, we implemented signage and, and public education materials on board buses um, to encourage social distancing and, um, and all the appropriate um, public health practices in accordance with the Metro Public uh, Department. Um, and uh, so all of those efforts came as a result of that initial uh, contact with the health department and just asking them to come and assess us and give us their recommendations so that we were 
uh, secure in the fact that we were following uh, guidelines because we knew that they were getting um, a lot of material from the CDC as well. Yes, um, and the pamphlets and materials that you got to um, educate the public, do, have you received any feedback uh, from anyone? Have they talked to drivers, anyone about um, kind of how it affected their understanding of COVID both in general and then specifically on uh, your vehicles? Absolutely, yeah, we got uh, a ton of questions initially. Um, you know, one of the biggest questions that we got as a result of, of, uh, of all of our materials and, and our messaging was, you know, how long, the, how, how long does it last on surfaces? <laughs> and so that wasn't directly affected uh, or addressed in our materials. So we went back to the health department and asked them to put together uh, uh, some materials that we could use to kind of put that out. We worked uh, also with a representative from uh, Centers for Disease Control. Um, and so that, you know, it was just, I think what we found most interesting was the more information we put out, um, the, the, the more in depth the questions became because people were really searching, uh, trying to search through the minutia of of um, information that was being put out on social media and, um, and different sites about how it spread. Um, one of the biggest uh, campaigns that we ran that got the most attention was just how to wash hands and how to, um, <clears throat> how to take uh, gloves on and off uh, without, uh, without spreading. So um, all of that material that we put out generated questions, which uh, had a, a, another effect that it drove traffic to our social media sites, um, and our call center sites received uh, an uptick in, in calls just from people wanting to know if the information was correct. And they wanted to see if they could get the actual resources themselves so they could spread it to their family as well. That's awesome. So you really became a great conduit for all of this information that's flowing out, um, especially considering the conflicting stuff you can find if uh, you don't Google very specifically how to do it or how to absolutely. research this. So um, that's great. Um, I will definitely circle back to this. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Pamela, uh, Comet in South Carolina, you have um, been among some of the agencies that have begun delivering uh, foods to um, older adults who have not been able to leave their houses and get um, have access to groceries. So can you explain sort of how that relationship developed and how you began um, providing that service? Absolutely, and thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you for having us here today. Um, so how that all came about is, um, first of all, I like to say our executive director and CEO, John Ando, makes um, it part of our mission to that we're out in the community and we're inserted in a lot of these organizations and their committee meetings and their boards so we know what's going on so we're not just serving the community we're actually an integral part of the community as well and he serves on um, a committee that was convened by the city of Columbia to look at um, trying to tackle the problem of food deserts so he called up the people on that committee and said hey what can we do is there anything that we can do since people weren't coming into Comet Central our hub um, for our food share program, you know, so what was it that we can do? Where, how can we go out? And um, so with him and several others, one of the people who was on that committee um, was the executive director of senior resources and said, hey, you know, maybe you can help us. We have a backlog and a waiting list of more than 100 seniors that are waiting to get some kind of nutritional support um, can you help us deliver those? And at that time, we had gone to um, a modified schedule. I think it was a Sunday schedule at that time. And so we were able to bring some of our drivers back um, to help us with those food deliveries. Um, and we uh, probably were doing maybe 100 a week. Um, and so that's how that got started. Um, and how we promoted that was, of course, we went the traditional channels um, as far as um, with press releases and media alerts. Um, but we also pushed it out on social media as well. Um, a lot of our riders, especially, are very, very active on social media. 
many times we'll get information or contact from them through those avenues from Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter before they call the call center. So uh, we got a lot of feedback that way, a lot of um, interest in why we were doing that. And uh, we're actually entertaining um, working with uh, an organization called Rare Variety Farms um, to help them deliver fresh produce um, to those places where there are food deserts. And it's not so much um, older adults and senior citizens, but it's more those housing projects that, you know, there is no um, resource for fresh fruits and vegetables that they can access. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, do you, uh, this is kind of coming off the top of my head, but do you foresee mm -hmm. doing that even after the pandemic subsides or maintaining that type of service in the long term? You know what? It, it really depends. Um, we're not at full service yet. We're not back at full um, service delivery as of now. So, so we do have vehicles available that allow us to deliver that service. I don't have a crystal ball, but my guess is that once we're back up full and running, we may not have um, the manpower nor the vehicles to be able to continue, you know, after it's over. But, you know, that remains to be seen. You know, we'll see. Um, you know, we're always willing to help, you know, where there's a need in the community. And, you know, we not only transport people, but we transport goods and services and the things that people need. Okay. Very cool. Um, so, Alex, it looks like, uh, has a general question uh, for everyone. So, I'll let her break in and um, ask one. Great. Yeah, so this came in from one of our attendees. Um, so, just a reminder, if anyone's listening in, for those of you that have joined us, feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box. Um, but Rachel is asking if anyone has had a rumor or a misperception become popular among writers. Um, and how any of you have addressed that in your communications. I know, Pamela, you mentioned using social media, which a lot of that is rampant there. So I'm wondering if you want to start. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting how rumors start. Um, we were in the process of um, obtaining RFPs for a new uh, service provider. And, you know, some somebody reached out to us and said, yeah, I heard a company in Atlanta is taking over the Comet. It's just like, how did, where did that even come from? Nobody who even uh, <laughs> went for the RFP was from Atlanta. So it was just really interesting how things get started, you know, but what we, what we do is we try to nip it in the bud. I mean, it's interesting. I always say my job is 24 seven because even after I leave for the day, you know, I'm monitoring our social media. Um, and trying to respond in real time. You know, we have a policy of responding within three days, but, you know, I try really hard to, you know, get it within the first hour. Um, and I found that doing that nips a lot of things in the bud, and then they tend to tell each other. And so after you post that first post, you know, you'll, you'll see that uh, the people on social media will repeat what you said. You know, so that kind of helps diffuse the rumor mill you know, where that is concerned. So that's, that was one of the things that, that uh, came out first and foremost. The other thing is uh, the mask policy. Now, um, our approach had been, you know, South Carolina is an interesting place. We love it, but it's an interesting place. You know, and, and there has been some pushback on the wearing of masks in certain segments of the population. Um, and then again, there has been a lot of adoption of wearing masks. And so, you know, initially we decided, you know, we will follow the, the lead of the governor. Um, if he makes it mandatory to wear masks in public, then as a government entity, it's easier for us to enforce that and say, hey, we're going to make masks mandatory. Um, but we strongly recommended that our riders wear masks. And um, the um, organization that at the time was our, operated our, our buses like, you know, the, the hired the drivers and different things like that, did not have a policy in place that made it mandatory for the drivers to wear masks or any kind of face covering. So that kind of put us in a quandary. Um, we got a lot of, you know, uh, on social, you need to have masks or, you know, 
people shouldn't have to wear masks or this person looks like, you know, that they're going to rob somebody and all kind of different things like that. So we had to diffuse a whole lot of that, especially initially. Starting um, Monday, June 15th, we're going to make it mandatory for masks to be worn, but we're also going to supply those masks. And that was the key right there. You know, how can you, um, you know, some of our population, you know, doesn't have a lot of income. How are they going to get a mask? You know, we'd say they can wear a face covering. Well, maybe they don't have anything at their disposal to be able to wear. So um, once we were able to get um, disposable masks, you know, as, as you all know, that was a process in itself. Um, you know, now we feel confident that we can require the wearing of, of masks on our buses and um, the drivers will have face covering as well to protect them. I also want to add one of the things that we've implemented was fare free. Um, we started that somewhere near the end of March and rear door boarding and what that did was um, mitigate the number of people who were coming past our drivers in order to keep our drivers safer as people were getting on and off the bus. So, so address the scale so to address some of the social media. The only thing we really heard was um, about the intellectual and developmental uh, community that we serve. And there was rumors about um, who was going out of business and um, what was going to happen to that community. Um, we did launch um, a safe to ride campaign uh, to address fears um, of the people riding the bus. And we did implement that everyone, our drivers are masked and gloves, but people entering the bus are wearing a mask. And we gave the driver the um, authority to you know, decline um, taking someone on a ride. But we provided the mask once we were able to procure enough masks to make that available to everyone. We really went into a large um, kind of a media campaign to address the fear about riding transportation. And because we run smaller vehicles, even from a uh, Ford Transit vans to the body on chassis buses, we felt comfortable with implementing that six foot social distancing. And so we were trying to be out ahead of um, any negative things that might've come up on, on social media, you know, from a web, um, you know, putting something on our web page to address um, COVID and what we were doing to mitigate it. Um, we even put something out on in rural Colorado um, on a marquee that we, we launched a campaign called Safe to Ride and we put some um, decals on the front and in the back of the bus saying Safe to Ride. We did some um, TV, a TV spot and um, some print media and it really was just to address um, the fear that people had. So yeah. we're going to start rumors um, we also implemented, you know, a much more stringent driver training, and we now view, I'd say, about once a week, you know, random, um, are the drivers doing the right things with the masks and gloves, and to impress upon them that even if they're alone in the bus, there's a lot of perception and just to continue wearing the mask. So I think we've been able to avoid, you know, any kind of negative um, consequence of, a, of the fear that people might be experiencing now. Yeah. Andrew, can I add a little bit to what Gail was saying? You know, I, 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 I'd forgotten. I don't know how I forgot this. Um, but one of the big things that we got beat up on social about was like, why are the buses even riding? You know, businesses are closed down. Why are the buses even riding? So what we did was we did an op-ed that says, why are we running? And it made people really understand the people who are riding the bus are the pe are, is that nurse tech that's helping that doctor that's taking care of your loved one in the hospital. It's also that person that needs to get to the pharmacy to get their medicine, you know, and, and we really painted the picture of what these people look like. Fortunately, we had um, launched a brand awareness campaign way before COVID-19 with actual riders and using snippets from their stories to put on outdoor advertising banner ads and things like that. Well, we repurposed that and pivoted in that brand awareness campaign to talk about, you know, um, taking her there so she can take care of you, getting them the, the resources that they need. Um, we had a, a college student who could very well be somebody that works in the storeroom of a grocery store, you know, helping him get there so he can take care of the things that you're looking for, you know, and keeping the Midlands moving. 
um, even during a crisis. So we really repurposed that whole campaign and pushed that out on social as well as traditional media. And then with the op-ed that we did. That's really great. Um, and that's definitely a very important message to keep spreading. Um, mm -hmm. And so hopefully we'll see a lot of that going forward. Uh, Nick, did you in Nashville also have to um, kind of deal with a bunch of mis or disinformation um, spreading around about uh, transit and safety and um, all of that? Absolutely. Yeah, we had um, what's what's a bit more interesting on our end is that um, I don't know if it's if it's unique to just Nashville, but. Uh, the majority of our rumors started uh, internally with our uh, with our operators and so with our em employees. So um, even before we started to deal with a lot of uh, of the rumor mill outside the company, um, you know, one of the things I, I like what Pamela said. Um, you know, one of the things that we did uh, to kind of address a lot of internal rumors, you know, because there were you know comments and stuff coming in, we should just shut down or. You know, why are we still running? And one of the things that we kind of impressed upon our employees was, you know, if it's that easy to shut us down, what keeps us running when everything comes back up? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we're if we shut down for um, for just a week or so, you know, what prevents them from saying, you know, when it when it's time for budget uh, talks for the for the for the city, you know, what prevents them from saying, well, you know, we shut them down for a week, we might as well keep them out for another a month or so uh, because of due to budget cuts. So, um, you know, I, it was very, very interesting that we had to address a lot of the rumors within. For example, you know, if we had a, a positive uh, test result or an employee that tested positive for COVID-19, uh, then we spent a lot of time addressing employees uh, because people were going on witch hunts trying to find who it was and, you know, what building did they work in and where did they uh, you know, would, did they come into the break room, you know, while I was in there? And uh, so we spent a lot of time just kind of addressing people's fear internally uh, because we found that if we could, if we could calm our internal employees, then they were our advocates for, for all the rumors that were happening outside the company. Um, you know, when people would board the bus with, with things, if we had addressed them already internally, then our operators were the spokespersons and they were saying, no, nah, it's not true. You know, here's what happened. Uh, here's what we did. Um, so rather than focusing so much uh, externally, we focused internally initially. That's fascinating. I would never have thought of that um, starting there. Gail, I'd like to add, I think that's a great um, point you make about the internal communications and even the fear within our own community, you know, in the office here and uh, the drivers. And I, I hadn't thought of it in that way, but you're right. We were, I think it was our driver training and that's what we, we were doing without even thinking about it that way, because there was some concern about, um, are we going to have jobs? And then are we safe doing what we're doing? And especially with the reports coming out of New York City and the amount of um, transit uh, drivers that had contracted the disease and even died. Um, so thank you for bringing that up and putting it in that way, because that is a um, something that we dealt with, but I don't think I articulated that way I thought about it. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, oh, sorry, it looked like, Nick, you were going to add on? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time with, uh, with, with our public health department, too, in, in understanding their process so that we could then communicate that to our employees. For example, um, you know, a lot of questions were, you know, should, should an employee um, contract the virus? Um, you know, are we doing our own internal contact tracing? You know, and, and so that was a huge, huge ordeal uh, initially. And so working with the health department, uh, we understood their process and that they would send out an investigator to that person. You know, the investigator would then, you know, determine if there were close contacts. And so we began to work really closely with the health department where we were doing some, a little bit of contact tracing, but we were just turning those names um, over uh, to the health department for them to kind of verify 
uh, if the, if there if those particular names had come up while their investigator was doing, you know, talking to the person that had um, that had tested positive. Um, so we really, really, really had to focus in on 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 that part uh, to make sure that internally we weren't sending out disgruntled workers because they would then join with the public <laughs> in any misconceptions. And then, um, you know, we, we would do, we did, uh, we do internal memos. Um, so um, twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, all of uh, the leadership would get together on a call and we would discuss some of the issues and our public information officer would, uh, you know, I, I give her time to, you know, give us some, some of the rumors that were, you know, coming in on social media um, and so a as a result of those meetings, we would then send out an internal memo to all of our employees, you know, kind of updating them and highlighting some of the things that we were doing, some of the things we were hearing. And uh, one, of, one of our employees leaked one of those internal memos to the news media. Uh, <laughs> and so then, you know, so now, and that's because I believe that that employee was, um, you know, a bit disgruntled about something that had happened internally. So we we looked at that and was like ah we've got to we've got to beef up our communication internally so that we're not sending out disgruntled workers into the work field and and they're spreading just as bad rumors as the public is conjuring up um, as it related to it. That's really interesting, um, Pamela and Gail. Have you guys worked with um, the health departments in your areas on similar issues? I'll go, so thank you. Um, it was really from the isolation uh, center um, consortium that um, they were always on these calls as we were planning and um, developing how we were going to create this isolation center for the homeless in the community, that uh, they were one of the leads um, in, in, the, in that and advising us. But as a uh, private not-for-profit and you know, really just focusing on a I we'll call it a niche market of um, intellectual and developmental disabilities and older adults. Um, we just listened to them um, fairly closely, but we did not reach out and consult them. We did have the School of Medicine, um, the assistant dean give a uh, Zoom meeting to staff and drivers regarding, you know, well, what is the COVID virus and you know, how do we mitigate it? And it was, it was only an hour Zoom meeting. Um, from this school of medicine uh, dean and some of her interns, but it really took a lot of the fear away from office staff and the drivers. And it wasn't anything new. It, I think it had been communicated from the CDC and um, other uh, agencies you know, looking at this um, infection and, and mitigation. Um, so it was reassuring, but that's, that's really all, all we did. I'm really impressed that um, the other agencies have been so, um, I guess, uh, collaborative and working so intentionally with their, their county department. Okay. In um, our collaboration with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, um, some of the things that we did was um, we partnered together and um, they provided us with um, messaging and posters and information to put on our buses and in our facilities about how to keep safe from COVID-19. But they also not only gave us words, they gave us actions in that they provided us with over 100 cases of hand sanitizers um, to use on our buses. Um, and um, well, Comet Central was closed at the time, so it's mostly for the buses. Um, and in our headquarters facility where, you know, um, where our bus depot is. Um, so that's been really, really helpful. Um, and in addition to the posters, of course, we, we uh, co-opted um, or collaborated on some social media messages um, to get that across as well. Very good. Um, and so we have kind of alluded to this a couple times uh, in a lot of your comments, but uh, that makes me want to dig more into how you communicated your value to the public. Um, and that goes back to Nick, what you were saying about um, internally, if the drivers think, or you know, the public thinks we can shut down this easily, uh, then what's to reopen us? So um, how have you communicated that 
I guess now that we think about it, both internally, but then also externally through you know these op-eds that you mentioned, uh, Pamela, um, and then uh, to your drivers, Nick, um, is there anything else that you've done in that? And then also, um, if there's been anything yet uh, focusing on um, convincing people to start writing again, I know that um, your states are a little bit ahead of where we are in DC as far as reopening. So I'm curious if you're at that point yet with um, convincing people uh, that they should ride the bus again. Uh, sure thing, Andrew. We, we um, you know, one of the things that we did to uh, kind of curtail a lot of the uh, information uh, about the, you know, if we could shut down this easily, uh, what keeps them from shutting us down uh, um, in the future was by, you know, our CEO, Stephen Bland, was very adamant in, in making sure that we were messaging at all times to all employees that uh, because of uh, some of the CARES Act money that, that uh, was coming to our state, uh, that we would keep all of our employees whole. Um, you know, they would be paid. Uh, if there was a shutdown uh, that came specifically from uh, from the government, then, you know, we were intending on keeping everybody paid, keeping everyone employed. Um, and so, you know, then there, there came the discussion about hazard pay. Um, and so, you know, we were, we're communicating with our um, employees through our internal memo as well, that we're looking into it and that we're, um, you know, doing uh, heavy, heavy thought and, and strategy on uh, how we would implement it um, and, and so all of that kind of internal communication, I think, brought the, the fears of our employees down. Um, and then they became a little bit more um, open to the idea of making sure that we were communicating that th to the public through their messaging every day. Um, because the reality was, and that we saw even from our communications team, the reality is, is that um, our bus operator and sometimes the mechanics um, are more of the face of the company than our CEO. Um, and so if, if we're communicating well with them, they communicate well with the public. Um, and, then, uh, and then we saw the residual effect of that was that our, um, as soon as we saw, uh, you know, our, our mayor kind of introduced a phased reopening plan, as probably uh, did most of the other cities. Um, but, um, you know, in phase one, and phase two, we started to see an uptick in ridership. Um, and I think that was because we had communicated so well with our employees that they were now communicating uh, with, with the public in the sense that, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know, I had heard and, and talked to several people in, in other agencies, but didn't know, uh, didn't notice specifically that uh, other agencies were cleaning buses in between trips. Uh, and so as a result of that, you know, we could we could message it out a hundred times a day, but those uh, those passengers getting off a bus or waiting for the next trip to go out, seeing a, a, an employee jump on that bus and wipe down, was more effective than a hundred uh, messages on social media. Uh, so that was what we used as kind of like our own uh, marketing tool per se uh, to help the public understand, hey, we're safe, and I think that's. That's one of the most important things was, more than anything, we wanted our passengers to know and trust uh, that it's safe to ride our services, um, mm -hmm. that we're running ads to show our enhanced cleaning efforts. Uh, we've create, we created what we, what we like to call shadow buses, um, and those buses are used if passengers are discouraged from boarding a bus that's already at its peak uh, ridership and attempting to maintain social distancing, uh, then those shadow buses, you know, if an operator passed that uh, passenger, uh, the operator would call our dispatcher and say, hey, you know, at this stop, um, you know, to keep social distancing in place, we passed, you know, maybe three or four customers. Um, then we had shadow buses that were staged along that route that would, uh, that would come along and pick those passengers up on an empty bus uh, and bring them into our downtown, um, our hub. Um, and so, you know, we're also in the beginning phases of partnering with Uber uh, to provide first and last mile services. Uh, we struck a deal with one of our third party transportation services to take uh, passengers to and from testing facilities, as did, I think it was Gail uh, that mentioned that. Um, 
but we use separate rented vehicles uh, through that third party. And all of these efforts say to the public that we're here for you um, and that we're, we're taking care of you uh, by taking care of the things that, uh, that get you from A to B. Yeah, um, similar to Nicholas, um, we do have a partnership with Uber and Lyft for that first and last mile. And that's been really helpful as we have modified our service delivery. Um, and we also have tracker buses um, for when a bus is full because of social distancing. Um, we have that bus that can pick up that overflow. But what we've been doing is that we meet daily as a team, all operations folk, and talk about what today was like, which routes were heavy, what was the time of day, and that's really helped us to get a handle on the fluctuation um, in ridership, you know, as far as when is the heavy time, when is the light time, you know, and how do we work within that. Um, you asked the question about communicating value. Um, one of the things that, and it was a small thing, but it wound up being pretty impactful. So when the governor shut the schools down, you know, you had a lot of parents that were trying to scramble, what am I going to do with my kid? You know, after, I, after we've done the math and all the homework, you know, what else do I do with them? And at that time, we had um, developed an activity sheet. It was a coloring sheet on one side. It was a connect the dots and word search on the other side. And it was promoting our soda cap, which is our downtown connector trolley service. And what we did was we distributed that to our partners, to the media, and through social to, you know, to all of the outlets that we had and said, hey, we recognize this is a tough time. So for the young and young at heart, you know, here's something to do to kind of take your mind off of you know, the looming pandemic that's in front of us. And that did two things. That showed that, you know, we're parents and aunties and cousins and people who are learning as well. Um, but it, and it also reminded them, hey, when all this is over, Soda Cap's gonna be here, you know, so catch the trolley. So it kind of gave that top of mind, but at the same time, it was a nice thing to do. Um, the other thing that we did was uh, we participated in Sound the Horn Day, which is like really, really cool. Um, and, uh, as, and as you all know, that during the pandemic was Transit Driver Appreciation Day. So the gatherings that you would have had, you couldn't really have and different things like that. So what we decided to do was extend Driver Appreciation Day over the course of the last two months where we would feature a driver every other day, tell a little bit of their story and say, hey, say thank you to your driver because they're out here, you know, in the midst of the chaos and they're getting you to where you go calmly, safely and reliably. Um, and the drivers appreciated that because it made them feel, you know, that we appreciated them and the um, and they got to read on social, you know, all of the passengers saying, yeah, I ride her route or she's a really nice person and thank you and, and things like that. So, you know, those were just tangible kind of ways, it, you know, in addition to us writing little note cards of people who they serve saying thank you um, there. And also we told drivers, I mean, rider stories. Um, you know, this, is, this person, um, uh, you know, had to go to work because they're an essential employee you know, so we're heroes, moving heroes, you know, and this is what they had to say about, you know, riding the comet, you know, yeah, I have to be at Walmart at 6 a.m. and my bus gets me there, you know, and so we told those kind of stories. And also, um, we gave all our employees a service bonus. And that's, you know, for those who could not work at home and had to be at work every day, you know, they got a little bonus just to say thank you you know, for your dedication and your loyalty. When it's oh, good. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Pamela. And we, okay, and the other thing was, we also increased our disinfecting from twice a month to daily. And we communicated that and took pictures of that and pushed those pictures out on traditional and social media. So um, here in Colorado, I think we're a little ahead of the, um, much of the national curve on the, pandemic and its effects. And as a specialized transportation provider, um, we're, we're being asked, we're rolling out a little bit more now than our, our low at the end of March and April. So but we've been active in communicating with our community center boards that are 
um, working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We're working with our kind of managed care organizations and predominantly with the mental health. We believe in, um, we've been given some federal grants and local grants to support the mental illness and substance use um, disorders. And I think uh, I'll, I'll admit I'm buying more gin than I normally do. So we can only uh, see from people in our um, community the effects of what we think will be a big, almost a wave, a strong wave of people that are gonna need more supportive services. So that's one of the reasons we kind of looked at our Safe to Ride campaign and we're really intentional about that. And reaching out to um, our other community agencies, public agencies, as well as partners. Another part when we talk about the value of um, transit, um, but we also focused on our own internal values as an organization. We spent a great deal of time two years ago rebranding and um, redefining the mission and vision and values. And so we really um, impressed upon um, from all staff meetings um, three key uh, values that um, Invita embraces. And one is our resiliency um, and to keep doing the right thing. And it was the compassion for the people that were serving that still had to get services like dialysis and go to work and get groceries. Um, and um, innovation to look at how we deliver our services um, differently. And I think by um, articulating and reinforcing those values in the organization, uh, then the people that are out facing in our organization are reassured and then communicate that. Um, you know, it was fun watching um, one of our drivers being interviewed on TV and, and how he communicated his values. So we think that that was a, um, a great way to um, you know, invest in you know, what we do and why it's important. And I think we also, in, Pamela, in similar ways, we gave a small, almost like an appreciation bonus for, you know, thanks for being here and it's tough and we're all a little afraid of what this means um, to our communities, to our economy, our jobs. But thank you for being here and continue doing what you're doing because what you're doing is important and we are essential workers and we do support um, people that need our help, but we also support the economy. And so it was really kind of, um, I don't know, it was a don't waste a good crisis. It really was an opportunity to um, look inside the organization and the people that we employ and the people we serve and to look at what we do and our impact. So who knew I was gonna think it was not a bad thing that this happened from a organizational change uh, perspective. Great, and um, Andrew, I'm gonna jump in because we've gotten a couple questions in the chat box here, and I'm gonna kind of merge two of them together. So I'm sure you all have all seen or heard about the CDC guidance that initially discouraged riding transit that they have since walked back. Um, but I think in light of that, one of the things that a couple people mentioned Jen, that they're curious about is if you all have been preparing um, a communications plan that kind of works with the phases of how you're going to be reintroducing or kind of restarting your service for back of, lack of a better term and if that communications plan that you're working on takes into account um, those somewhat discouraging messages that that are kind of existing in the media right now. Um, so I don't know if any of you want to comment on that. This is Gail. I mean, I, you know, I've been following that. In fact, um, a call I was on before this one was a, an economist from the local university here presenting to council governments. And yeah, one of them was, yes, and transit will be down if it ever comes back. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And so, um, I, I believe from a, um, as a specialized transit provider, I would not be surprised if our services um, uh, demand goes up because we are smaller, smaller vehicles, and uh, we can be, and they can observe uh, greater intentionality about our disinfectant and cleaning. Um, I, I'm not sure if that'll be true, but uh, I think that's what we're looking at our um, scenario planning um, for our workforce and uh, staffing levels. Thanks, Gail. And I guess for the other two, 
as you, you know, reintegrate routes or things like that, are you thinking in advance of having different types of communication or different ways of communicating with your community as those th changes or that happens over the course of the next, you know, few months to hopefully not years, but who knows. Uh, sure. Yeah, we're, we're, what we found is that uh, by and large, we're using our social media um, to communicate that out to our, uh, our passengers, even in terms of just, uh, you know, we're tracking, we're, we're using uh, data analytics to track you know, our heaviest routes. And, and, and historically, we know uh, which ones have, have been our, our heaviest routes. And so those are the ones we kind of targeted initially is to say, you know, we're still maintaining social distancing, we're still doing uh, cleaning, uh, we're reaching out to some of our allies, our stakeholders. Um, there's a group uh, here in Nashville called Music City Writers United, um, and, and they're an advocacy group for, uh, you know, people in disadvantaged neighborhoods that, that ride transit. So we're communicating with them. One of the things they wanted to do was um, was come by and set up at, at, at our central uh, a hub uh, to distribute masks to um, to the riders that are on those um, kind of uh, heavy routes that are going to some of the disadvantaged communities uh, here in Nashville. And so as people see us partnering with them, I think it communicates the message out as well that um, that we're not only just trying to, you know, I think, of course, always internally, we're trying to make sure that our uh, operators are safe because if they're, <laughs> if we have no operators, then certainly there would be no writers. Um, but, uh, you know, the advocacy group like Music uh, City Writers United, what they did, uh, one year they did a study, uh, very interesting, they took uh, a picture of our public uh, bathroom there at our, our central hub, and uh, they put it next to a, a bathroom from one of the county jails, and they asked, uh, you know, writers and, and the public to pick which one was <laughs> the jail and which one was uh, our public bathroom and uh, they they published that study and um, a large uh, a large percentage of people uh, saw our bathroom as less than the bathroom of, of a public jail and uh, so as a result we uh, you know through some funding and grant uh, and grants um, we procured some some funds to redo our bathroom so we uh, renovated our bathrooms um, so the actions like that, I think, are, are what is needed. Um, you know, uh, another advocacy group that we have is our disability advisory group. Uh, so we meet with them and ask them, you know, how are things going? Uh, we found a story that uh, one of our operators um, had uh, insisted that uh, a person in a wheelchair load at the back of the bus. Uh, and, um, and so not only, you know, is that, is that violating ADA standards, but you know, it's just the, 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 the perception of, you know, one operator. And so we pushed out a message. One operator um, uh, making a bad call can affect um, the public perception of our, of our agency. And then uh, what that leads to is, you know, if we can't get people to support us and get behind us when legislation goes uh, uh, before council, um, then, you know, we could lose funding. And if we lose funding, then we start reducing service we start reducing trips. Uh, so communicating that out, I think, has been the biggest um, uh, effective tool for us, as well as working with some of our advocacy and, and, uh, and uh, advisory groups. Yeah, um, to piggyback off of Nicholas, you know, our, our advocacy groups and advisory groups are really, really important. We have the Midlands Transit Riders Association, and any messages that we put out, they actually distribute those messages as well, especially through social. And early, we've been relatively fortunate um, as far as the perception of the viability and the um, essential nature of public transit here in Columbia, um, because early on, um, even before uh, the governor shut the schools down, we were hammering out the message of safety. This is why it's safe to ride. And we put out three or four messages before, you know, I think we got uh, way ahead of the curve of people wondering, is it safe to ride? You know, because by that time it was ingrained in people, okay, this is necessary and they're doing everything possible to keep me safe. You know, they are, and, and we took pictures of the fogging of the buses and all of these things and the masks and um, 
the bio deep clean solution and what that looks like and where we were applying that. So all of those images were out there, you know, heavily on the front end. So I believe that that helped us out a lot. What we're doing now also, in addition to traditional and social media is that we're um, going to be pushing out PSAs um, about COVID-19 and our response, especially as it pertains to the fact that um, masks will be required and for at least the first 45 days, we will be supplying masks to everyone who rides our buses or enters in our facilities. So, you know, that's just another layer of, of the communications that we're doing in light of that. So your job has gone from 24 hours a day to 48 hours per day? Something like that. <laughs> Listen, I, I dream about work, but that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so we only have about 15 minutes left. And so um, while I could talk to you guys about this for days, it seems, um, I know Alex has a lot more questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to... Um, let you let loose with a couple more of those questions. And um, so go ahead. Okay, awesome. So some of these are um, a little bit quicker. So Pamela, I'll start with this one, which is directly with regards to your um, food access efforts. Um, and they're wondering if you've considered um, some of the section 5310 resources available to continue that after the current pandemic subsides. Yeah, um, we're, we're looking into that to see if that's something that's viable for us. Um, I'm not sure, uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where that will take us, you know, as far as how we look at service delivery, but that is something that we are considering um, to see if it's something that we can um, enact here. Great, yeah, and I, I do feel the need to mention that we all know that 5310 hasn't received additional funding um, through any of the current federal legislation. So even though I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities in 5310, we do know that comparably they're, they're definitely hurting um, with regards to the pandemic at the moment. Um, yeah. This is, let's see, this is a little bit of a generalized question that I think any of you might be able to answer. Um, so this, um, Patrick is wondering if any of you have considered communicating some of kind of the themes that you've discussed, whether that's cleaning and disinfecting buses or driver appreciation um, through things such as like video screens on buses, if you have those in your vehicles. Um, and if you think, you know, whether it's on your vehicles or kind of ad spots, if you think video communications are an effective way to communicate um, with your riders in your community. Yeah, uh, one of the things we did uh, was we worked with our IT uh, team uh, to kind of uh, communicate those kinds of messages on our uh, destination signs. Um, so instead of just uh, displaying the route, uh, the route name and the route number, uh, we would also flash to uh, messages like, you know, social distancing is keeping everyone safe or, um, you know, we have your back. Uh, so just little, little messages, little quick uh, excerpts uh, th that that are forward facing as the as the bus is arriving at a stop uh, are ways that we uh, kind of address that. I believe that um, adage around the uh, agency. You know, I keep saying well, no one's really reading anything. You got three sentences, so um, it, I do believe that we're doing a lot more with the video or pictures just to express what we're trying to do. Um, we do not have uh, any kind of mechanism to do that on a bus at this time, though. So it's all done from more social media perspective. Also, uh, Alex, one of the things that, that we're doing internally um, is, is running our own. Uh, we have a, um, a digital content management system uh, that is internal uh, on TVs, um, in all the break rooms at all three of our locations. Um, and so a, um, a, a driver approached me and said, hey, the local news um, had um, featured me as a, as a hero. Um, and so, uh, you know, what are you guys going to do? And I was like, well, this is a perfect opportunity for us to start our own internal WeGo uh, hero campaign. And so uh, I initially took pictures of maybe six or seven operators and mechanics 
Um, and so we started our own We Go Hero campaign. We flashed their picture up uh, on our digital uh, content management system, their name, their information. Um, and, you know, we just kind of cycled that. And then we got on a call and encouraged all of our supervisors and directors and managers, um, hey, if you, you know, see someone doing an exemplary job, then take a picture of them and tell them that, you know, they're your hero um, and, uh, and they're, you know, they're frontline heroes as well. So then we'll put that, we'll send that to our communications team. Our communications team then cycles that new picture into um, the database and then that begins to pull as well. And so, you know, as they're coming back from a run or something or in between on a break, uh, you know, they see their picture flashed up on, on the 80 inch screen TV and uh, it makes them feel like a celebrity. And uh, if we can make them feel celebrity-like, then they make our passengers feel the same. That's awesome. Um, and there's one, there's one more question, Andrew. I think we have time to uh, ask it. Great. Um, and this kind of goes back to some of the things we talked about earlier. Um, so feel free to just kind of add anything if you have additions to it. Um, but this, Jeremy is wondering, um, I know, Nick, you've talked a lot about internal communications, but for all of you, if you've been having internal meetings with your drivers to keep them educated on what's happening and how the internal communications are also changing and making sure they're communicated. I know, Nick, you said you had bulletins going out twice weekly, um, but Gail or Pamela, have either of you guys um, implemented any of that kind of similar internal education or communications? So yes, uh, we do uh, much more intentional uh, driver training meetings that we're hosting and all staff meetings are really just addressing, you know, where we are as a community, you know, nationwide, then, you know, state and community wide, and then uh, what we're seeing within our ridership. And um, so it is very intentional and it is around the safety and the disinfection um, for everyone to be safe. Yeah, it's, it's intentional, but it's difficult to keep addressing because it keeps changing all the time. It's hard, I think, for management to keep it up with um, what should we be communicating because after a while, everyone feels like there's mixed messages. And so we really have gone to a much more personal, hands-on approach face-to-face um, -face with people. Yeah, that's great. I know I've talked with a few systems that have ended up um, putting dates on everything they send out um, because everything changes so quickly that it's helpful to have it dated. Um, Pamela, I want to give you a chance to um, jump in before I turn it back to Andrew. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're in the middle of hurricane season here and I just had a downpour so I didn't hear everything. And I think the question was, how do, how do we communicate internally? Is that the gist yep. of it? Yes. Okay, so we've increased the number of meetings we have internally between um, the operations staff and the administrative staff, um, and that's been really helpful. Um, so instead of meeting, again, meeting monthly, um, we have daily calls to kind of update, um, give updates on what's going on in every area, whether it's communications, whether it's, you know, boots on the ground as far as the routes, you know, with, uh, and um, how we're doing on the cleaning and um, safety and sanitation. And, you know, we kind of cover a whole lot of areas. So it gives us information in real time so that we can be very nimble and respond quickly. And I think that's really important, you know, and, and if, any, if COVID has taught us anything is that we need to be nimble. We need to be able to not take you know, days and weeks to deliberate on something, but we need to be able to make decisions quickly and to respond to things in real time. And um, these platforms have given us the ability to do that. Great. Yeah, Andrew, all you have. Yeah, you guys are doing fantastic work. Uh, so it's been great to hear about this. Uh, one parting question is, um, do you have any formalized uh, COVID-19 communications plans that you uh, could potentially share with our other members just to give them ideas and uh, something to build off of for their own systems? I know, Pamela, I'd love to see your um, coloring handout, if you'd be willing to share that. That'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Other, I'll be other happy to share that. <laughs> 
other than our template, um, actually, I, I've got a copy right here. This is kind of, uh, this is just a template, the internal template that we send out. Uh, I know you can't, you know, you won't be able to read it uh, all, but it's just, you know, we, we kind of give, uh, we keep that header up there. Um, and so every time they see, you know, this posted somewhere, they know that it's an update. Um, and at the at the bottom of it, uh, we always give you know the name and information of uh, of the safety uh, of myself, the safety program manager, um, so that our internal people know who to contact if they have a question about COVID nineteen. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, people can have questions, but if they don't know the proper channel uh, or who to go to for the questions, then they kind of feel uh, kind of isolated. So. On all of our internal memos, we keep that header the same and we put the information down on who to contact for any questions. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thank you all again for your time. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation for me. And um, so before we wrap up, uh, I want to remind everyone listening that uh, CTA has our COVID-19 resources um, on the slides right here. So we have our resource page, buyer's guide, best practices, and uh, on our blog as well. And as um, everyone on the panel mentioned, uh, research changes. Uh, so we try to keep up with it as everything changes. And so it's as up to date as possible. And so I'm going to hand it over to L'Oreal Lance uh, to wrap us up here. And um, I will be in the Sun breakout session. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to our fabulous panelists. What a lively session, and I think it's just what our colleagues needed in the transit space. So with that, as Andrew mentioned, we are off to breakouts now. Breakouts will start at 2 p.m., so you have just over 15 minutes to find your breakout link and get, get where you need to be. We did add the breakout into the chat box. And so if you can't find your link, please look and click there now before this session ends to make sure that you're where you need to be come 2 p.m. And if that doesn't work for you either, feel free to email expo at ctaa.org and we'll get you all sorted out for the last sessions of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. L'Oreal, and thank you all. Thank you again to all, all of our panelists. Thank you, Andrew, Alex, and L'Oreal. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.